Welcome everybody to School Side Podcast. We're so ba- uh, glad to have you back with us. This is, um, I feel like it's been a while because I think we had a, a maybe three weeks between our last episode or something, but um, so getting back into the groove still a little bit. Um, our guest tonight, uh, I know through, you know, some of you know that I'm involved with uh, the Reading League chapter in my state and Reading League has these kind of um, coffee and tea mornings where they bring on people who have published in their journal uh, for kind of conversations to, to explain the journal and just have discussions. And so um, as a chapter leader in my state, I kind of facilitated that and um, met our guests through the and, and read her article and whatnot. So, um, and vocabulary to me, we, we've had a couple episodes on, you know, kind of basic reading skills. And we were just talking before we went live that vocabulary uh, sometimes gets kind of forgotten. And so um, I think it's really important and um, it'll be a good conversation tonight. But my name is Rachel. I'm a school psychologist in Maryland. I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca, who's going to tell everybody how to participate tonight. Rebecca. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm so happy that you're here, especially because if you're here, you're probably not watching the Grammys, which is a lot more boring than we are, I hope. Um, So thank you for being here, whether you're watching live or later. If you're watching live, we're going to be uh, including you in our discussion. So please feel free to just log into your YouTube account and you can comment right alongside the video in the chat and we'll be responding to those questions and comments and experiences that you share. If you'd like to make a comment that's a little bit um, more removed from the video itself, you can comment on Twitter using the hashtag psyched podcast and you can at podcast psyched us on our Twitter page, or you can also comment on either of the Facebook pages, our school psyched podcast page, the dedicated podcast page, or school psyched your school psychologist. You'll see the posts for tonight's event on both of those Facebook pages. And we're just looking to uh, looking forward to hearing from you anytime, even if you're watching or listening on audio um, uh, versions later in time. We'd love to know what you think about this conversation. And so I think I did not mention that I'm a school psychologist currently in the state of Florida. And uh, I'm also a student at Nova Southeastern University. And I'm very excited to share with you that I've been talking to school psychology professors on campus this week. And I have a lot of cool stuff coming up to share with the team. Um, And we're going to get some um, some more good episodes and guests out of my new connections there. So now I'm going to hand it off to Eric, who is going to introduce himself and our wonderful guest. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Well, we are excited tonight to have uh, with us Dr. Ellen Kappas. And um, we're going to talk about, as Rachel mentioned, perhaps vocabulary. Is it a forgotten skill? Um, And before I introduce Dr. Kappas, um, This is the uh, kickoff week for our National Association of School Psychologists annual convention um, in Denver, Colorado. And I hope that everyone who is there is having a great start to the week. We want to hear from you. We want to hear how the convention's going and what you're learning, what some of your favorite uh, workshops are. And uh, we are sorry that none of us are there this year. Sometimes we're all there together and and have our little uh, podcast meet and greet and those kinds of things. So we'll have our fear of missing out, our FOMO, uh, while you're all there and we're not. But um, somebody's got to stay in the districts and get work done as well. So, um, But have fun if you're there. And uh, if you're there, reach out to us. We'd love to hear how the conference is going. Um, so uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Alan Kappas. She has a doctor of, uh, doctorate of education in curriculum and instruction with a a specialization in literacy and language of second language learners. She has over 25 years of language teaching experience. Her strengths include research and data analysis, excellent communication and team building skills, robust knowledge of current literacy and language evidence-based practices. She's fluent in French and Spanish. She's an assistant professor in higher education to train pre-service teachers to improve outcomes for multilingual learners at uh, the University of Jackson or Jackson University. Jacksonville. Jacksonville University. Jacksonville University, University. Yes. yeah. Private university in, in Jacksonville, Florida. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dr. Kappas. Welcome. We're excited that you're here tonight. Well, I'm glad. I'm really happy to be here to talk about words. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, let's start out uh, with that little 
a little mysterious introduction about forgotten vocabulary. Tell us about what's going on with uh, the current state of perhaps vocabulary assessment and intervention. Well, you know, I think there's been a number of studies. Newman and Wright did this observational study of what, how, how much uh, vocabulary instructions happening in classrooms today. And I think it was as little as, you know, 5% of the day was dedicated for K to, you know, the younger kids where you think more of that word instruction would be happening. Um, and, you know, when I'm in classrooms in here in Duval County, I don't see word walls. I don't see that active word learning uh, evidence that I'd like to in, in all classrooms. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the actual core and the basal readers, the, the methods that they've integrated to teaching words just aren't robust enough. They, they might introduce the words, um, a set of words that would be in that, in that basal reader, but they don't do the review activities that are necessary uh, that really help make the, those words, um, you know, give that ownership. The students need that ownership of those words, and that, that needs to be more than just sort of a drive-by instruction which I see in a lot of the resources, the ELA resources. So I think, you know, with this sort of lack of knowledge teachers have about just a good vocabulary instruction routine um, and not having that support in their actual basal reader, teachers aren't really sure how to teach vocabulary in, you know, in a really effective way that makes sense for kids and gives them that, those really fun review activities. So I have a question. So when we think, you know, and this is often repeated in kind of the science of reading community that, you know, phonics and phonemic awareness and like you need explicit instruction in the code because that's not absorbed kind of like we absorb language um, that, you know, a baby, we don't, we don't teach children maybe how to speak. They, they just kind of pick it up. So w could somebody argue that like vocabulary is that going to be picked up? Do most people, most children kind of pick that up as they go? Like, so the benefits of vocabulary instruction is that Excel, I mean, obviously that's accelerating it and then supporting that. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah, Maybe. I mean, through oral language and background knowledge, right? Yeah. I think there's like a super high correlation between background knowledge and vocabulary, right? So you're going into a supermarket. Do you know the names of all those fruits and vegetables? You know, does your, is your, are you, do you have that sort of interaction um, with an adult that's teaching you these words that, um, you know, some of the words that often are missed are some of those abstract words like prepositions. I remember the first time I realized my first graders didn't know the difference between before and after. I was like, what? Like that, you know, to me, such basic, you know, such a basic understanding of the world, but no, those there, there's some really um, flagrantly missing pieces, missing uh, words that children aren't learning unless they they're 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 you know getting sort of explicit instruction from an adult, you know, from birth on, and you know we know with all the, the hours that they're spending on devices, it's not even really a socioeconomic issue as much anymore. I think it's just like sort of that lack of building language, um, the lack of, you know, talking about the world and using that sort of, ac those academic terms as well, uh, you know. Um, so the language of school differing from that sort of those tier ones, sort of just that sort of very concrete words that young children learn. Um, that needs to be explicitly taught. It, there really just isn't any way around it. and. You know, teachers need to find those 300 words. They have to agree, you know, to some extent, whether they use the Fry list, where they use the Hebert list, but really to close that gap, that that word learning gap that exists from with low socioeconomic and language learners and those that come from families with a lot of oral language, you know, you got to be teaching 300, 350 words explicitly a year, that target word, through that target word instruction. I have a question. I, I'm not, this is not my area at all. So this may be like a really dumb question, but um, those in those early grades, they're learning um, like their 
spelling words and spelling rules, how far, and I know those words have to be simple and like, you know, start with cat and hat and you know, all that, all the rhyming words, but how is that, how is vocabulary instruction kind of not built into that same program? They may not be spelling words like sunrise or, or whatever, but um, are they completely separate or are they sort of, are, are the, should the instruction be like on parallel tracks somehow? No, I think what you're talking about are what we call like sort of the root words or base words in English. You know, those CVC words that children start learning to read. Yeah, language learners need to know the meanings of those words. A mat. What's a mat, you know? Uh, so definitely a bat. And I use manipulatives for my language learners when I was teaching the phonics. They learn the word meanings too. And like Anita Archer does an excellent job at that. And she, her phonics for reading program is one that teaches the vocabulary as well um and yeah i just recommended that to a student she's going to be using it in her her internship um for a little intervention so yeah I, that's a good question rebecca those words we sometimes don't you know those need to be taught especially for our language learners um but we like to focus those 300 400 words sort of that those high frequency less known words um is how we look at them, sort of like tier two minus, not super sophisticated, but if we look at the fry list, Patrick and I would then look through and say, yeah, like a word like produce or a word like portray, or, you know, once you get up into the higher grades, and then we, we would have, you know, uh, look at where a kinder, you know, what are the words for the kindergartners? What are the words for the first graders? And, you know, we pretty much did that work and created those word lists. And, you know, the teachers that we worked with tweaked them and added some content words, character traits. They added some math words, you know, those prepositions. But I, I think that's something, you know, that work's been done. I mean, there's a lot of lists out there. It's just a matter of teachers getting together and saying, okay, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's look at that target word instruction. Let's figure out the, let's carve out 15 minutes of our day and teach 12 words a week. And, you know, that, and, and then do some really fun review activities where the kids are running around with the headbands and, you know, they're looking at the word wall and they're going to they're going to connect to in a sentence. And they're, you know, we do the morphology games where they have the, you know, they have words with affixes, but then they have similar root words. They have to find their little team of, you know, the, 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 the root word. I mean, kids just grow into little word wizards when you're actually giving them these opportunities to learn words and, and review their meanings in fun ways like that. I love the term word wizard. <laughs> I know they do like on the playground, you hear them starting to use the words and that's really that, that um, when the teachers in our studies heard the students using the language, the words that they were being taught, on the playground or they saw evidence of it in their writing it was really like fidelity to the intervention they were just so excited about teaching vocabulary that's and, amazing yeah do you think this might be the result of curriculum issues or teacher training or uh yeah, maybe a little I, of both yeah i think so i think you know in the past we didn't really know you know, the number of repetitions it's it takes to learn a word. Um, we didn't, you know, there weren't studies about that. We, But now we do know it's 12 to 24. You know, I mean, we know that it it's significantly quite a bit of repetition and use of these words. Um, it could be that, you know, um, and it's definitely missing in curricula. You know, I mean, there aren't it isn't really evident a lot of them that I've seen really robust instruction. Um, and, you know, things get presented to teachers that really aren't research based, you know, graphic organizers. Um, and they think that that's what they do. And then there's just sort of like that emphasis on spelling, you know, and a spelling list. And, and that's kind of where we've been, not so much in, in, in really expanding our vocabulary and, looking at it through that multifaceted approach, you know, strategy, which would be the, you know, the morphology, 
and then the target word, which is really that sort of quality. And then the quantity, the word flooding, where you're looking at teaching uh, a collection of words in a really specific thematic exploration, um, building on kind of Camille Blackowitz, you know, virtual field trip, where you're building that poster and you're building uh, a month of discussion around the habitat or around, you know, works really well in social studies and science. You're building um, knowledge at the same time you're, you're, you're exposing the students to all this uh, vocabulary in that, in that content area. So looking at it through those three lenses and having those, that three pronged approach as a teacher. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's just us in our studies. That, that's the only time I've seen it. I think that as school psychologists, we don't really do too much with vocabulary. I know that so many of our, our referrals, reading referrals and learning disabilities and whatnot, you know, frequently we hear teachers that, oh, the comprehension, they don't understand what they're reading. It's usually, you know, they don't focus in on vocabulary. And it's just kind of interesting to me that that's a, such a common referral lament is, but then teachers are not teaching vocabulary or not in, in school psychologists. It, it, it was interesting too, um, there's an intern in my district who reached out um, to ask some questions because she was going to run an intervention on, on vocabulary that it was middle school kids and working with uh, the content level teachers to kind of pre-teach sets of words to help them better access the lesson that was going to be for that week or that day or whatnot. Um, and I thought that was so cool that she was able to do that and was doing that. I'm assuming it was part of her coursework to, to run kind of a, an intervention. But as school psychologists, I feel like, yeah, we, we rarely get pulled in into that. And it's usually in the context of like, oh, we're testing for a learning disability. And then, yeah, people kind of forget about vocabulary. So if, if I was a school psychologist and I wanted to kind of get into this a little bit more and work with some kids that were identified as, as needing intervention in this area, um, what type of strategies, I mean, you, you mentioned some already, um, but if I have a list of words, what, 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 what is the lesson going to look like, kind of, so to speak? Well, like the target word, so if you're looking at, you know, target word instruction, where there's the seven steps, right? So you have the image of the word. You're going you're gonna to use the word in a sentence, if you can, like if it's not a kindergartner or a first grader, you know, if it's a second, you know, if they're reading. You want to kind of show them the word in the sentence. Um, then you're going to have a child-friendly definition. And, you know, it's not something that's that easy to do on the fly. You know, like I wrote these scripts for 300 words for our, our interventions. I, I, I spent a, quite a bit of time, you know, and then so, so the steps are one. So you find an image and it's so easy to do that now. You have, if you want, you can find, a, you know, the, use the word like in, uh, in a sentence. So let's say the word is insist. Okay. So today our word is insist. And um, I have a picture of a mom trying to put a jacket on a little kid, you know, so that's my image. And then I have, you know, my mom insisted I wear my jacket. Let's say that's the, the word. Or you, if, you're, if it's for older children, maybe you find it in the text that they're reading. Um, and then you have your child-friendly definition, which is uh, insist means, you know, that somebody really wants you to do something. Somebody's really uh, or wants you to do something. And they're kind of make you do something. Um, and then you're going to have, you're going to kind of connect to their background in a way. So you're going to kind of bring, zero in on their grade level and say, okay, what, 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 what think about a time that, that your mom insisted that you do something. Does your mom insist that you make your bed? Does your mom, does the teacher insist that you walk slowly in the hallway? Right? You sort of connect it to their background. And then you, uh, we do, the next step would be a non-example and example. I think this is super key where they, um, you give them a little quiz. I'm going to say some things. If you think that it has something to do with insist, say insist. If it doesn't, don't say anything. And, um, you know, so then you would give them the little quiz, um, 
um, my sister um, told me to brush my teeth, right? Is that an example of insist? Yeah, so then they say that. And then you want, then there's the two activities of part of the steps where you're really getting the students to talk. So it's a sentence stem where they're going to talk about the picture or, and then also, so using a sentence stem, and then they talk about the picture. Can you turn to your pers your partner and tell your friend how this picture shows and sits? So two of the steps are really about getting them to talk. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much the, the seven steps. And then, you know, that picture goes up on the wall with the word. And then, you know, you teach 12 a week. Um, some of the teachers taught, you know, them, they divided like Monday, they taught six, Tuesday, they taught six, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday were reserved for review activities. And then the review activities are what you would do for fun to, you know, to, to review the words, um, bingo baker, they made little bingo games with the images, um, doing word wall activities where you're combining the two words into sentences. Um, the headbands where they they wear the word on their head and they're walking around and they're looking and they're asking their friend for clues to tell the word meaning. So all, all sorts of word review activities that, that we play. So that's the target word instruction that, you know, you can see Anita Archer has a video doing that. You can see our, where we have videos up doing it. I have teachers that I have, if anybody really wants to see a teacher in kindergarten, fourth, fifth grade, I have videos of, of teachers that are implementing that target word instruction um, I can share. Very cool. We like sharing things. And I know you have a, a lot. Yeah, of no, I like to share things, too. After my presentation last week, I had teachers that said, are you really going to give me all those words? I'm like, I sure am. I'm loading them over to the, your Google Drive right now. Start teaching vocabulary. You know, as a fourth grade teacher, she wants her whole school to get on board. So that was really exciting to hear. Somebody in Palm Beach. I'm, so, I'm such a new Florida person. Um, not Palm, like Palm Beach. Like, I think it's between here. I don't know. Somewhere on the coast, though. Plus, I think close-ish to where I am. But that oh, is yeah. exciting. Yeah. And it, it makes me think about Mark Brackett. I don't know if um, you're familiar, if anyone out there is familiar with his work with the ruler program and it's it's based on emotions and what he calls emotional intelligence but basically what he's saying is like if we don't have the pre precise vocabulary to explain how we feel and understand how we feel we then can't regulate it you know so little kids who are just you know if they lump everything into I'm mad because they don't have the word for frustrated or disappointed or, you know, like it's, it's just, it's a really essential piece of social emotional learning too. So even the verbs beyond the adjectives for feelings, the verbs of like beyond this person is mean to me, this person insisted that I, you know, like I, I can see how that's just so helpful for social functioning too, not, not only academic. And in that sense, Right, really? to expand their ability to talk about how they feel, right? Yes. Give them more words to describe their emotions. And yeah, I think super important. Um, yeah, I, it, you know, working all these years with language learners that, you know, and the words I'm going to teach tomorrow to these sixth and seventh graders that are newcomers that have been sitting in their middle school really not getting very much are just those concrete words. You have to start there. You know, you have to name things first in your environment. You have to become comfortable with what you, what you, you know, and, and, and get a little bit of that language, that pronunciation under your belt and feel okay about it. You know, we're not, I told my students when you're observing, you're going to see that I'm really looking at receptive language to begin with. I'm not asking them to, I'm not going to ask them to produce for a couple weeks. They're going to be learning lots of words, but through a receptive uh, instructional, you know, technique, um, which is with images. And um, so that's what we'll do. And it'll, I think it'll be, you know, and then they can read as well, which is receptive. We can find those words in a text and put them together. But especially a middle schooler who's 
you know, are new to the language, you, you know, you don't want to make them uncomfortable in front of their peers. Um, I'm sure you know that, right, at <laughs> school, Scott. So you really want to be very, you want to tread very lightly in, in making sure that they're super comfortable before they're going to open their mouth and, 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 and give English a good old try as far as, you know, talking. There weren't, there weren't many talkers when uh, we met them last week. They were kind of, they were nervous. Now, I know that you've said that you go around to conferences and you present and whatnot, and you hear other presenters, and I know that you've referenced before that some of the stuff being talked about out there isn't always accurate or best practice. What are some of the, the maybe some of the myths or some of the things or misconceptions that you hear out in the schools, out in, in seeing other presenters that are... Yeah, I think, you know, it's just, I think there's two things. I think when you're presenting, you need to present research. You need to present either your own research or somebody else's that, you know, something that has been done and you can share those effect sizes. And I like to share the links. You know, it's really, I just share my whole presentation, you know, with the QR code and people can go back and read more. I think it has to be based in science. And then also it has to be something that teachers can then take back and do. Like if it's just sort of this abstract idea of morphology, I went to a few of those where I think the presenter was really excited about morphology and the origin, the etymology of words. And yeah, but, but, but what does that mean for kids? And how do you know, how, how do you move from, you know, you know, that body of knowledge that you're sharing to the classroom where, a teacher can just pick it up and and do a lesson and you know and have that succinctly you know so i think that you know in conferences that at the conference that was probably my biggest some of the some of the some of the uh, presentations that i attended that just didn't have that thought out either they really weren't based in science they weren't really based in research or they weren't really thinking about well what are teachers going to do with this Right. So I think when you go to a conference, I think you really want to be looking for both of those. Like, am I going to have something that I can take away? And is it based in science? Yeah, we had a discussion in our last episode about precision teaching. And I think it's it's like really hard to be a teacher these days. But, it you know, like there's almost not enough time in, in graduate school in some ways to, to, to get all the science. So I wonder if there is hope in these, you know, um, professional de development experiences and, and like building on what you get in grad school in two years of a master's program um, to become a teacher uh, to then move forward with learning more science or, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not being articulate. I think it has to be I'm teaching undergraduates and really, if you just look, so for example, you know, for teaching uh, ESOL, right? What do we know? What does research say? Well, you look at the IES recommendations. There's only four of them. You know, they, you don't look at second language acquisition theory. They're all theories. You know, if I want to look at what works in the classroom, I'm going to start with what IES recommends. And I'm going to start there. We can learn the theories. We can learn crashing Cummins. We can learn, you know, Halliday in this, you know, we can learn about translanguaging. We can learn about, but they're all theories. Nobody's tested them. But in that field, they've just gotten away with it for years. Just be, that's what, that's what you learn. If you're going to get a master's, if you're going to get an undergraduate degree in ESOL or TESOL or whatever, you know, everybody calls it something else. Um, you get that regurgitated in one class after another, instead of this class is going to teach you how to teach vocabulary. This class is going to teach you how to teach academic language. This is going to teach you how to write a language objective for content. And that's, that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to divide this program because I pretty much can, I guess. I mean, I'm just going to divide it so that it's practical. And then, and then we're lucky with, with literacy because we're, we have Mount St. Joseph, we have schools that are helping higher ed professors align their courses to IDA and they're giving out the syllabi. 
you know, on, on their, so in the, in the science of reading and teaching in undergraduates, I think we, you know, there isn't really any excuse for not getting that science out in front of students right away and not admiring the problems. We're not looking at the debate. We're not looking at the, we're just looking at what works and we're moving quite quickly from phonological awareness, what it is to how do we teach it? I mean, I'm going to give my students a quiz this week on sounds, you know, they're going to have to, I'm going to give them the grapheme and they're, they're going to have to give me the sound, you know, I mean, we're moving really practical and I really have hope that, you know, higher ed is, is transitioning to that. Um, instructional rounds, you know, my students are going to be able to see me teaching these sixth and seventh graders this week and observing, learning the theory, you know, the, well, the theory and the practice and the, the actual science behind it. And then actually, you know, and then they'll be able to give it, a, you know, gradually releasing it to them. So in the semester, they'll be able to be teaching students as well. So, you know, I think, Rebecca, we, we've just like missed, like, I think a lot, there's been a lot of wasted time in higher ed for, for people um, in, in, the, in the education. And I think that's why we have, don't have a lot of people going into education because they, they graduate and then they're in the classroom and they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. You know, I don't know if if anybody else has that experience out there. I mean, I worked with a first, a second grade teacher last year um, in Wyoming. And, you know, it was just a wonderful experience to, to, you know, me as a seasoned person, her as a brand new teacher, co-teaching, you know, it was again, like just one of those really optimal ways to learn. And um, you don't get that opportunity that much. Yeah, it was, you know, it's funny, Rebecca and I were actually talking about this a week or so ago um, about behavior and classroom management as well and how beneficial it would be for veteran teachers and new teachers to to co-teach or we have a model when we're learning counseling where we have, you know, an in-ear um, microphone and a, a seasoned uh, counseling professor is is watching us through video or you know a two way window, and they're giving us suggestions, saying you know follow this path of the conversation or um, or go down this this direction with the client. And I wonder you know for teaching as well how beneficial that would be to have you know uh, veteran teachers or or professors showing us showing our teachers how to classroom manage how to um, instruct and problem solve in the instructional process when a student is stuck or, you know, having that firsthand example um, right there with you would be amazing. That's great that you get that opportunity. They kind of whisper in your ear telling you what to say. <laughs> you can say here. I know it's like, that's really amazing. I mean, I would love that. I mean, I, as a teacher myself, that's where I learned. I learned through a co-teaching you know, I learned through other teachers that I was able to be teaching with at the same time. And it was just um, in Wyoming when I started teaching ESL, we, that was our model. We had newcomers coming in daily at that, you know, like it just seemed. And then, so we had two teachers in the classroom, those for the, the students that had been there for a number of months and those that were just arriving. And, I, you know, I, I find that that is one of the best ways to learn is, you know, through, through another teacher. Um, it, and then looking at the data, right. Being at that MTSS meeting and saying, okay, everybody, let's rip off the bandaid and we're going to look at our scores here. Yeah. And, and I've been at meetings like that where teachers have looked over at one of their colleagues and said, what did you do? What did you do? You, you, you you had some great results this week in this math unit. Yeah. How did you how did you teach it? I think that's so beautiful when that happens because it does require a lot of humility to be, you know, even to just be observed, but let alone to have a supervisor kind of coaching you through something because I think our expectations uh in you know, in school psychology and in education are that you'll get out there, whether it's student teaching or your first year, and you'll be perfect, you know, you'll, and, and so it's, it's, I think there's, 
that piece that we have to normalize. Everybody is good at some things and needs work on others. And whether you're early career, mid career or a veteran, we have to all try to improve our craft. And so um, I think that, you know, if we can get that sentiment into our schools, because even in schools that I've been in where um, teachers are doing uh, workshops just based on what they're good at. I, I'm really good at, you know, reading instruction. You're better at behavior management. or And so they offer all different workshops. And I think a model like that could be really useful. Yeah, I do. I mean, I really think that we need, you know, schools need to take seriously the data and look and work together and, and have that growth mindset and not be, not, you know, like you said, Rebecca, just be, willing to learn from others, you know, I, I, and, and not, and it isn't personal. It's about the kids, you know, and I think when we make it just about the kids, you know, there isn't, it isn't about you. It's not, then I, I feel like that there's, that opens the door for people to have that discussion. If we just really focus on, on, on kids. We've talked a lot in the podcast about, yeah, effective instructional techniques and things of that nature. And it's just, yeah, it's unfortunate and kind of ironic that we have, you know, universities that are training and are not using these, one, they're not teaching their teachers to use evidence-based techniques. We've got a lot of kind of pseudoscience and things um, there. And just the, the methodology that they use to teach the teachers is just you know, not, not what it should be. It's, you know, thrown into, <laughs> thrown into the fire type of thing. And uh, yeah, so I like all that. I mean, the same things that we preach for effective instruction to teach reading, we need to be using effective things to teach teachers to teach reading and um, yeah. that, you know, explicit instruction on how to do it, like what you're doing, and then gradually kind of releasing it and doing it together and modeling and then practice, pra you know, like all, the, all those things that it's just crazy that... <laughs> Kind of I know awesome. it's almost like well you have to you have to instruct you have to teach the words you have to build that background then you can do the project you know but I think it was even in an interview with a university you know that one of the professors asked me she looked at my seven step routine you know I in my demonstration and she said why don't you ask the kids what they think the word means and I said well it sort of first of all defeats my it's like totally undermines my whole <laughs> approach it's explicit instruction and and i just said and and what happens then is you have students that are going to throw out word definitions that don't really have anything to do with the word and then there's that kid who's going to be listening to that 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 classmate and that's just going to stick in their head they're just going to learn the wrong meaning we don't First of all, we don't have time. We have 300 words that we're, you know, we need to get these words taught and we need to get them, we need to have fun practicing them. But then the other thing is just the wasting of class, you know, time. And then the, the, the chance that somebody's going to absorb the wrong meaning because of that, you know, and I, I didn't really go into that. I didn't even really answer at the interview. It was an interview. I just said, well, that really isn't, you know, I'm, I'm more of a, this is more of an explicit instructional approach to teaching a lot of word meanings. Um, you know, I wasn't really going to go there. It wasn't, but, but, you know, it made me think about it a lot in terms of who we are as Americans and this whole idea of sort of this constructive approach to education and how everyone has something to bring to the table and we have to accept everybody's points of views and, and get everybody's knowledge. And then with that, we can construct learning and knowledge of the world. And I think it's just been such a disservice for language learners, you know, that, that approach, that sort of philosophy of constructivism, as opposed to that explicit instruction where I know you need to know these words. There's going to there's going to be, you know, your 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 actual test, your standardized test is going to be all vocabulary. You know, I mean, they, they read these. Patrick Manick just told me he's, his fifth graders were just tested on the California test. I, I don't know what it's called, but he said, Alan, it was all vocabulary. The kids were like heartbroken. They're like, I read the passage. I understood the passage. I just didn't understand any of the words in the multiple choice, you know. 
answers. I, I, you know, I couldn't understand the question that they were asking me because of the, the vocabulary. I'm like, yeah, you know, so, you know, we, we want to be of service to our students. And I think the best way is to teach them explicitly. And, you know, we know we have, a, we, we have a pretty good idea what they need to know. So, you know, I just, I, we, we can't really waste any time. I do think projects are super important. I, but I think once you develop that background knowledge and that vocabulary, having students do something with that is hugely important, especially language learners. So that's a big part of my instruction for them is getting them to do something, but I don't get them to do something without teaching a, quite a bit of words before so that they have some context. That's interesting. And I'm just thinking about my lifelong and feeble attempts to learn Spanish. <laughs> and I'm wondering if I need to just stop worrying so much about the grammar and just learn some words <laughs> like already. Um, yeah, I mean, unless you have 250 words, you really aren't going to be able to make a sentence. You can't, you don't, the syntax doesn't, I mean, you can learn some greetings, right? You can, you can say how, you know, how, and I, you know, I need to go to the bathroom or do, where do I go? You can ask some simple, like social questions, but you're not going to really be able to talk about what you're thinking or until you have quite a bit of vocabulary under your belt. And then you can introduce the syntax and have, you know, so that's kind of how my approach with these, you know, you're just, we're just going to focus on learning a lot of words and have fun doing it, you know, through TPR, moving around, um, lots of games, um, image games. So, you know, and, and having them whiteboards and having them write the words, you know, that kind of thing until they get quite a few of them. You're right for so Spanish. Yeah. I mean, that's why those Babbel apps, like if you want a really good, if you want a good program for learning, I just recommended this one for my friend who wanted to learn Spanish. It's Pinsler approach and you can do it. And it is like, at first I was, I was trying to learn Kiswa. I was learning Kiswahili with it because I was going to Kenya and doing this teacher training. And I'm like, I, at first I was really skeptical about it because I was just doing it in the car. And like, you would just repeat what they said over and over, but it, it was working. Like it was actually working the way they introduced just a few words at a time. And then, you know, then you would go back and my friend's doing, she's doing a wonderful job learning Spanish that way. So it's an interesting method where you, they introduce a little bit of the language at a time gradually, and then they go back and repeat. It's kind of interesting. I would check that out, Rebecca. You mentioned before kind of the academic language and you know we talk about that in like like the BICS and the the CALP and uh, cognitive academic language proficiency and um, I think that teachers a lot of times with with ELL students they yeah they don't realize that there is maybe a vocabulary deficit or something there because maybe socially the child can have a conversation and can go back and forth but I think that people don't realize that yeah, when you're reading the science textbook or talking the social studies lesson, um, that there's a lot of academic stuff in there that is just, and like you said, like your students that didn't know before and after, like yeah. that, that you might not pick up that there's something like that, that there's a misunderstanding there in just talking like, Hey, how's it going? How's your day? You know, yeah. <laughs> that type of thing. so yeah. yeah, the academic vocabulary is really important to know that academic vocabulary is two things it's the vocabulary but it's also the syntax it's also how we construct the language it's it's those two pieces and often what gets taught is just the vocabulary and the syntax is completely really not taught you know explicitly there's people you know they're like oh if you teach grammar out of context it doesn't stick well i have not found that i have taught grammar to every age ELL and it does. If you teach them the possessive, th these there's certain things that have to be taught, right? The plural nouns. What does it look like? Changing Y, I, E, S. You know, just basic. You know, the, the, the most basic grammar, and then just irregular past tense verbs. Giving them practice with it, pulling them. That that needs to be taught to these these language learners at the same time as the vocabulary. And that is academic language and. 
And, you know, I, I really like the work of Jeff Zwiers at, at Stanford, what he's doing with ELLs and that oral language and the sentence stems and having that practice, that oral language practice that he does in his situations and all, all of his work is available on his website. Videos of language learners on, of all ages. He works mainly with the older, like middle school. But it's amazing to see their sort of academic discussions after being after it's been modeled to them and then they have their supports of their sentence stems and you know they they know exactly the turn taking that they're going to do and they have those that clarifying language they know what they have to say they've practiced it um yeah all, all of those pieces that academic language oral language that needs to be practiced the teaching of grammar and the teaching of vocabulary you know, I mean, those are those language objectives that anybody in the United States that's teaching in any content really needs to be aware of if they have not large numbers of language learners in their classroom. Nobody, you know, if you're a native speaker, you're not going to be hurt by that instruction. You're not, you know, you, you see that it's up there, you know, on the board, you know, um, you, you know, with those critical measurable verbs that always begins with that, you know, and um, you know, if you're learning language forms and grammar at the same time as history in, in your history class or your science class, it's it's not going to really, you know, it's just not going to hurt anybody, but it's going to really benefit those language learners. I like that because I, I feel like there's a perception that, yeah, that a, the language is just it's immersion. That's that's all it is that it, you you'll you'll pick it up when, once they're in it. And, um, you know, this in education, this tendency to push against this ex explicit instruction um, is kind of a pervasive thing, like for whatever reason. And so, yeah, I'm picking that up as kind of a theme as we talk to more and more people um, about some of this stuff that, yeah, what you said, explicit instruction, it's not going to hurt anything and it's going to benefit, you know, people that you, that you don't even know, like who, who you know, you can't figure out who's going to, who really, really needs this. Um, so it makes sense to just give it to everybody. <laughs> Just give it to everybody. That sort of thinking aloud, those queries when you're reading. I'm doing that with my students in higher ed. You know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to let's I'm going to start reading this practice guide. Let's open it up. I'm going to read it out loud. You're going to follow along with me. I mean, they were honest. They said, I, you know, I'm like, do you want a choral read with me? But I would never do that popcorn reading even with somebody at that level, you know, an undergraduate, they're not going to feel comfortable. And, and, you know, and so then reading that aloud and thinking aloud and knowing what's going to maybe trip them up or that they might or, or, or stressing what I really want them to know. And by rephrasing it, going back and rephrasing it, you know, I don't, do you see that much in classrooms? Do you see teachers modeling their thinking and that choral reading and getting, you know, I, I mean, I think that's comprehension I, and teaching kids, uh, you know, to, you know, pre-teaching those vocabulary words and then giving them that opportunity to, to, to hear you think aloud as you're reading and you're monitoring your comprehension and um, giving them that ability to, to kind of watch you do it. I don't see enough of that. I haven't seen enough of that in classrooms at all and i you know i I'm, i wish i would see more of it when you're choosing these you, you talk about you know 12 words a week like 300 words um in in a year um when teachers are choosing these things or, or when you chose you know the words for for your studies and whatnot um so these are grouped how are they grouped like how, how are you choosing what's what what are the good 12 words. Are these all words that are related? Are these all words that are coming up? They're in really lesson? not related. I mean, you know, I'm thinking most, our most recent study was the kindergarten study. So when I think of those words, we, we sort of, you know, like, um, but, but not really, they weren't, um, they weren't really related too much. You're just teaching them these were, I mean, to, if you could get them related more, like, I mean, I think there were some that were like more math, you know, that so uh, form, you know, um, I'm trying to think of some other ones, like I know form and we got like, um, 
you know, some of those prepositions in there at the same time. But it's really, you know, for the, we really did choose, we, we looked at the fry list. So the most frequent words, you know, he's got like 500, right? Or thousands, you know? So you looked at, we looked at that, the, the fry list, we look at Hebert's 400 word families. So between those two lists, and then the academic word list, kind of like looked at all of them and um, chose words that, you know, were high utility at that grade level and just less known. Um, and we also aligned it to, Fry and Rosinski have this book, this fluency book, these series, this series that is amazing. And they've done, so they chose these words. And so for the fourth and fifth graders and the third and fourth, that, that third grade study, we use that fry, we use their list and aligned it to their fluency passages so that it was a the student teachers could use those fluency passages. They were already written and those words are there. So that's another great resource for teachers. And I, they have one for every level. Um, it's um, fluency, who's it called? They're fly, fry and Rosinski's books, fluency high frequency words through fluency. I can't really think of the titles, but they're, they're out there and they're not expensive. And so that's, that was really nice to align it to that. Our second grade teachers didn't like those passages and they wrote their own. So in that intervention in the dual immersion um, school, they ended up choosing those words and making little passages with them. But yeah, no, Rachel, that's a good question. I mean, that, uh, the other, the word flood, the second, you know, uh, the second component of our multifaceted approach is all thematic. And those words we don't teach with such intensity. You know, they're up there on the board with our picture. We're reviewing them in video and read alouds and in when we're, we're talking about that content, but we're not teaching them using the seven steps. So those, those, those we, we really, there's those words, there's other words that I'm thinking of are like those connectors, like although, like that would be another word that would be fall into that target word list. Words that are academic, high utility, less known. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can look at, if you look up at our, our study, we have examples of those words. If you're interested, I can give you the, uh, the copies of them for the different grade levels, the words that we, we used with our scripts. I totally want them, yes. <laughs> okay, all right, I can, I can share them yes. with you, yeah. Yeah, because it's something that it's, the teachers definitely read the scripts, you know? It wasn't um, as if they were gonna just, um, if you have a word, produce, you know, that's another great tier two sort of child-friendly definition, finding the image, finding the example, non-example, all that takes time. It's not that you can't really quite do it on the fly. So yeah, it definitely, it, it'll, it's nice to have it written before you have the script. I, I use my own children as you know, I experiment on my own children, um, especially as a school psychologist, because um, you know I don't have a class to maybe work with, so I have to yeah. kind of find children to to do certain things with. But I, I use my own children a lot, um, so I, I'm going <laughs> to pilot oh, yeah. some of this with them totally. I have at one point, um, I don't even know how we came across it, but we got some sort of it was like fourth grade vocabulary words. It was just kind of a workbook and it introduced like 10 words a week and then there was associated worksheets. And so um, we went through, you know, we did story, we do story time every night and we went through those, those 10 words for a week and, and they loved that. And it was funny because they still use those words that we've talked about. One of them was vain and my, my um, seven-year-old would be like, oh, that was so vain of this person to say this. And I'm just like, it's just kind of funny. No, I know. And those character <laughs> traits, so character traits are great. Yeah. Those read alouds in, in, in those fiction books that, that you're going to, definitely pull out the character trait, right? You're not allowed to say sad or, you know, you're not allowed to say sad or happy. Use a different character trait. Um, yeah. And really, yeah, I mean, you can just print them out on little sticky notes. It's funny because like my kindergartners, I have a really good video of them playing go fish with character traits like timid and 
um, in, you know, inflexible, you know, these multi-syllabic words. And I had the little pictures of those character traits on the wall with the words. They're not quite reading, but I wouldn't give them. I'd be like, okay, you know, they could just look at the first couple letters and they'll get, they, they, they would remember them. You know, they, it, it's amazing. So definitely print, there's research behind that as well. Like even, you know, pre-readers having that word up there um, helps. Like, the, so they'll look at whatever, you know, the first sound of the word, the first letter, whatever they're able to, or the last one and, and be able to, to remember the word, you know, with the image. And yeah, that, that using the image, really important and, now we know with brain research that dual processing theory or, or, or they've actually found more evidence behind it that it really does help us remember you know having an image associated with a, a concept i never i was always searching because like that's the way i would tell i taught with images all the time and sometimes people would be like well are they just like me like memorizing do they really know the word or are they just associate with that image and i'm like i don't know but now i know <laughs> i think they really do start learning the word the image just helps them remember it i think this is really fascinating and i think as school psychologists you know i i i would say for my referrals for evaluations probably 75 percent are for reading difficulties right um and i I think just having more knowledge about vocabulary acquisition and intervention is huge. Um, when we're doing our typical reading evaluations, we're often looking at uh, phonological processes, right? Decoding skills, word level reading and comprehension and perhaps fluency in between. But we're not looking at vocabulary acquisition. At, at least I think I'm not and, and folks that I work with and know. Um, and a couple of our grad students in my district uh, are working on interventions. So uh, one of their assignments right now is to develop and utilize an evidence-based intervention with kids. And I think vocabulary intervention would be fantastic. So I've gleaned some things already just from our conversation that I'm going to pass on to our interns uh, this week and um, encourage them to utilize some of this for, uh, for their intervention projects. Oh, I would love it. Yeah. And just email me and I can send you, I can help Thank you out the way I can. That sounds um, great. I can support you with, you know, the images and the words and the scripts and, you know, that uh, the Rosinski Fry book, you could get that. I mean, that's a good way to start too. It's easy. It's there. And, um, you know, and then that seven step routine, like as teachers, um, once you, once you start doing it, and I've done lots of workshops with, with teachers, like getting them to write the routine. And once they, once they start getting a little practice behind it, they start, it, you know, you can do it. You, it just, you have to get in the groove. And it's something I think that um, grade level, grade level um, teachers really should come together and do. Like what words do we really want to hold our students accountable for this year? And Let's have them just even like, you know, the character traits we would have on the walls outside the classroom picked. And that was really fun. And so, you know, you, if you had a character trait um, initiative in every grade and they had their posters hanging outside in the hallway and kids walk by and they looked at the pictures. And so then you would have characters and you'd have it like in a grid. And so any time you read a new story and you had evidence of that trait, you put a little picture of the character in the grid, you know, that was one thing that you can do in the school. So, and then just, of course, like words of the week, I, you know, some principals will do that and just, you know, I mean, have a couple words a week um, and have them posted and pictures posted and, you know, reward kids for using them and, yeah, I, there's so many easy things that we can do to make, you know, vocabulary more important. And I really think we have to. I, I mean, I, I'm just so worried about all these kids on their devices, low language, so many more language learners in schools. And we need, we need, we really have to have, make more of an effort in schools to elevate the practice and teach them more explicitly. 
For sure. Um, so we are, are short on time. I have got one more, maybe you can answer this quickly. As school psychologists, we like to measure things. Um, and so I'm thinking like, if I wanted to see where a child's vocabulary was, I like, I'm aware of like the core, um, part of the core book. Um, there's a core vocabulary assessment. Um, we have certainly oral vocabulary and whatnot in our, in our IQ tests. Is there any, um, assessments that we should look into as school psychologists? Well, it, they, you know, I gave like, I don't know. 200 Peabody picture vocabulary tests to those kindergartners. So that's the, that's the one you use for kids before they're, and it's, you can give it to really any age. It's really interesting. It's fun to give it to an adult. <laughs> and then there's, you know, the Gates McGinnity, which is more of a multiple choice. So those are the two that I've used in, in our research. Um, and then, you know, I mean, just curriculum based measures, that I would create, you know, I use Nearpod a lot. So just four, you know, I kind of replicated the Peabody picture. You have four images and give them a word, you know, that sort of thing. You can create your own. Um, and yeah, and we did that. We did that for the taught words. We created our own. It's hard. you got to be careful. Like, you know, the, the Peabody, you know, that, that, uh, that is a, that's a wonderful test in that their images do they do a pretty good job you know when you're making it your own you really we, we patrick and i had some difficulty sometimes finding an image that really represented what we wanted you know for the word to be it sometimes could be construed you know and you want you, you kind of want that distractor you know but then you want something that's not too different from the word you know there's we kind of followed the strategy of the Peabody picture vocabulary test, but I would definitely look at that and, you know, use that one. And then the Gates McGinnity, which is with, with kids that can read. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. This is, this was great. And I, I, I think that, yeah, we were overdue to have a vocabulary episode. We've talked a lot about some of the, <laughs> some of the other skills and it's so the other components of reading that are so important, right? Yeah. yeah. For sure. Um, I want to remind people, let's see, I think the next um, podcast that we have scheduled is 3.5 on ADHD. So that would be good as well. And I want to uh, throw out there that we're talking and trying to organize um, as a podcast, um, a book study on Dr. Uh, McClure's um, Hacking Deficit Thinking. Um, we're trying to figure out dates, I think, and when that, but so anybody that might be interested in doing that, we're thinking three episodes may be devoted to that. And so if you haven't already picked up a copy, it might be, it might be good to, to track that down. But, um, thank you so much, Eric, Rebecca, any last thoughts? No, no. I love it. Yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. Sorry. <laughs> Just was going to say, I appreciate the conversation. I took some notes and I definitely have my takeaway. So thank you so much for your time tonight. Well, thank you so much for, for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. And please reach out to me. You know where I am and I'd like to help. Teach thank more you. words. Get more words out there. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.